Pushkin. Paul Simon's one of the greatest living songwriters. Since debuting with Art Garfunkel in 1957, Paul's written countless songs that are quintessential to the American psyche. This year at 81 years old, he's released the latest addition to his beloved catalog, Seven Psalms, to an outpouring of critical acclaim. In 2021, Malcolm Gladwell and Bruce Hedlum released the audio original Miracle and Wonder Conversations with Paul Simon. It's an intimate look into Simon's songwriting alongside never-before-heard live studio versions of hits including The Boxer, The Sound of Silence, and of course, Graceland. If you haven't listened to Miracle and Wonder, I highly recommend checking it out. It's available on Audible and at pushkin.fm. This fall at Pushkin, we'll be releasing an updated version of the audiobook with a brand new chapter featuring even more from Malcolm and Paul's newly recorded deep dive into seven psalms. To celebrate this newest chapter in Paul Simon's 65-year career and the latest addition to Miracle and Wonder, on today's episode of Broken Record, Malcolm Gladwell sits back down with Paul to discuss the creation of his newest album. Paul explains why he feels music reviews are more about the writer than the piece of music being critiqued, and he talks about why many of his lyrics take a more conversational bent. He also recalls how the title for his newest record came to him in a dream after he considered never writing another piece of music again. This is Broken Record, liner notes for the digital age. I'm Justin Richmond. Just a quick note here. You can listen to all of the music mentioned in this episode on our playlist, which you can find a link to in the show notes. For licensing reasons, each time a song is referenced in this episode, you'll hear this sound effect. Here's Malcolm Gladwell with Paul Simon. So how have you been? You've this, this album, I was reading through the reviews, and I was like, can I find a bad review? I can't find one. This has never happened. I'm so used to getting bad reviews myself that when someone like... You like hit for the cycle on this. It's like there's no. <laughs> That's a great. I like. I love all baseball metaphors. Well, it's very pleasant to have a hit. You yeah. know, uh, I don't read reviews, so I didn't read any of them. I'll tell you, they are a hundred percent. They are rhapsodic. You should read them. They're they're fantastic. They're like. <laughs> you know, if I do read them, I will not be happy. The reviews are about the the reviewer. Yeah. So. Number one, you, you, uh, you're getting an insight into somebody's ego, which is sort of private in a way. So I'm not really comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. Number two, some people get what I'm doing and other people don't really get what I'm doing. They still, evidently with these reviews, they still like it, maybe even like it a lot. But I don't, they don't go to the reasons that mm -hmm. I put there. So, uh, like, I'll give you an example of things that I've heard, because I haven't read any. He's dealing with his mortality. Uh, I can understand that somebody would say, it's not, happens not to be the case. You know, uh, the way that I write, I, I would say from that, they're probably mostly going on the song Wait, you know? The way that I write is, it's partly true, personally, it's partly like a wish that I have, it's partly other people's lives, but it's a, it's a character. Even though the character is m me, it's not really me, it's a character. So that character is dealing with the issue of mortality. That's because the way uh, that song was was written, maybe the one of the last or the last song. The, the reason that that it's placed there is because that's a way to conclude the piece. So it's appropriate, but it's not consuming my time and thought. Of course, it's it's there, of course. But I'm not getting something out that I have that I have to say. I'm concluding this long piece 
in such a way that it feels, hopefully, that it feels satisfying. Mm -hmm. Did you write Wait, thinking that it was the going to be the final? Yes, I wrote it as the final as piece. The, That's why much. I think it was either Wait or Trail of Volcanoes. That was the final piece that I wrote. What happened with Trail of Volcanoes was I had another song, and it didn't fit anywhere. And so I, I said, I have to lose this this one. It does. It's it's good. It was a guitar piece. It was. It wasn't. It wasn't a written song, but it didn't fit musically anywhere. It just couldn't find its place. I was at that point in the construction of the piece or the album where my my craftsmanship and my editing is dictating what I'm doing. It says to me that is slowing everything down no matter where you put it. And I'm looking for something to continue the momentum to get to the final lord and the conclusion, even though I didn't know what the conclusion was at that point. I understood from years of making records that it wasn't right for the set. So I tossed it out and uh, I said, I need a piece that has more of a sense of rhythm than the rest of the album because the rest of the album is very free rhythmically. There's no drums, there's no bass. But a Trail of Volcanoes comes from a, a loop, a bell of bells. So it's got a real pulse to it. Even though I don't keep the bells going all the time, I remove them and bring them back. But that served a good purpose for where it was in the album, just in terms of your ear, not in terms of subject matter. So that piece found it was placed where it is in the album for those reasons. And the end piece is there also as an end piece. And then from, from those two decisions, I then wrote, uh, wrote the lyrics. I didn't know what I was going to write in Trail of Volcanoes, which in a way you can tell from, from the way it begins. Some of my songs begin very conversationally. To me, that's uh, if I had to look at some old song and tell you what what was I thinking, even if I couldn't remember it, I would say, "Oh, I didn't know what I was thinking." Mm -hmm. So I just began. In Trail of Volcanoes, it's uh, when I was young, I carried my guitar. You know, that's a simple sentence. I don't know what what the point of the, I don't know what the point of the piece would be, but I did have the line "Trail of Volcanoes." It was in my notes. So that's what that song does. As it happens, it has an appropriate thought for the entire piece. But as far as the ear goes, it's the repetitive rhythm that gives the ear a sense of, I don't know, hopefully, hopefully it gives it a pleasure mm -hmm. after things have been sort of floating and not exactly arhythmic, but not with a tight rhythm. Here's a, here's a loop. And wait becomes, after these six songs, what subject would I be on? And uh, someone I played it for at that early stage said, having heard the first six, and I just had the track for the seven, said, Hearing these first six, I just feel like I really don't want to die. And there was the subject of weight. So anyway, back to, back to reviews and critics. That's how that came about. Mm -hmm. But if you were writing and saying, well, mortality is on his mind, it's not wrong to say that, but it's, I'm not interested in it as a thought because it's not actually what I was thinking. What I was thinking was sort of mundane compared to the, the idea of me contemplating my mortality. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was constructing a piece. Yeah. 
to go back a little bit, I was curious, the last record you had made prior to this was 2016. So this is the, this is the longest break you took between writing music. New songs. New songs in your life. Uh, yeah, it probably was. When I stopped performing and said I'm going to stop, which I think was in 2018, Yeah. one of my thoughts was, well, first of all, I thought this show that I'm doing, I've really taken it as far as I can take it in terms of rethinking songs and arrangements and, and anything that I did to that show as it then existed, it really would be in the danger zone of being Rococo, you know, it'd just be adding little things and because I thought it's really right now. So I don't want to continue doing this because I'm not going to get the, the uh, nourishment of rethinking songs and arrangements because they're really pretty well thought out. And if I don't get that, then I don't like performing because I'm bored. Mm-hmm. So I thought it's it's completed. It's it's it, its cycle is completed. It's a, it's not a bad time to stop. And as as for writing, if I continued writing from the way that I wrote the last piece of original music, which was Stranger to Stranger, I would be continuing problem solving in a way that started when I began to write when I was thirteen. So from the age of 13, when I wrote my first songs, my songwriting evolved in in the way that the way my songwriting evolved. So if I think of it as problem solving, I would continue problem solving in the same way. And from that, I, this is my internal conversation, I said, so I can make an album that's as good as Stranger to Stranger, again. And I thought that album was good. But I'm not really enticed to do that. So I'll just not do it. I'll just stop. And if I want to find something that's that's challenging and that's new for me, the way to do that is to shut everything down and begin again. That was my thought. I didn't then start to work on anything because time went by and then I had this dream that said, oh, you're writing seven psalms or you should be writing seven psalms. So I began, you know, whether whether it was subconsciously or not, I don't know, but I began to start from scratch again. Picked up a guitar and the, wrote guitar pieces and you know, got more in thinking about how I played guitar and just, I went back to what was the, the simplest way and I, I started to build from there. After about a year of writing guitar pieces, words started to come also from dreams, which is unusual for me. I mean, it's it's happened in the past that I've thought of a line or two, but that's not usually the way I the way I write, this this was un, this was unusual. Do you remember? Can you even play for me the first little bit of music that got you going on this? Yeah, the first thing that I did was to play the really the first song. You begin with the guitar part, write the lyrics, and then adapt. The then guitar. you start to then, then you, you go start back to yeah and fiddle. You you, you write uh, something that's uh, just comes to you for reasons that you can't explain. And uh, you start to think of what you might say over that. And when you find what you want to say, you modify the accompaniment Mm -hmm. so that it fits. Then it becomes a symmetrical pattern, and that pattern is repeated throughout. Every time the Lord section comes, that pattern is repeated. We're going to take a quick break and then come back with more from Malcolm Gladwell and Paul Simon. We're back with more from Malcolm Gladwell and Paul Simon. Can you give me another example from, 
of the kind of loop between the music and the lyrics that you were working on in, with it? Yeah, the process for me is a thought that comes from some place that I have I don't know. Just one second it's not there, the next second it's there. And uh, with that piece of information, it then gets put into a pile of uh, potentially to be edited, that pile. And the words start to come and as if it was as if you were sculpting a piece of wood or stone, you you slice away and chip away to find the right shape. And in the case of the Seven Psalms album, because it's really a voice and guitar, even though there are a lot of other instruments augmenting the sound of the guitar, essentially what you're hearing is a voice and a guitar which means that particular attention has to be paid to what the guitar is playing and the dynamics of the guitar, the volume of, you know, how loud, how soft it gets. And because it's an acoustic guitar, just the way you play it automatically has... The nature of it is that some notes are going to be louder than others because of the way the guitar is built and just acoustics. So one of the things that happened in Seven Psalms that was different from the other albums is that I really paid a lot of attention to making the notes, the individual notes of a of a piece be balanced and have a dynamic to them. So if one note stuck out in a way I didn't want, I could lower it in Pro Tools. Or the opposite. If it was too soft and I needed it to punch more, I could raise it. So one of the things that's unique about Seven Psalms for me is that I'm treating the guitar as an entire orchestra. I use the, the rhythm of it. So because it's just a guitar and a voice, I'm paying a lot of attention to what's going on with the guitar. And from that, I'm adding these other percussion instruments, mostly bells, but gongs. I can show you. Like, here's a bell. I don't know why, this is called an elephant bell, but so here it is. It's not so much the hit that I'm interested in, it's the, it's the overtones that are going to continue. It has a little pulse. And yeah, 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 yeah. So I would attach that to certain notes. Where was that sound used? What song? Oh, throughout the throughout. record. Yeah. Just must probably used a hundred times. And is that a, it's called an elephant bell? It's a, called an elephant bell. Is it actually a kind of vintage? Uh, it's not new. Yeah. I don't know how old it is. It's very unusual looking. It doesn't look. It's, it doesn't uh, look modern. It's uh, probably. Uh, it's probably Asian. There's kind of claws on it. Yeah, it has. It's probably you know. Uh, out of the Indonesian world. Where did you get it? Well, I have a lot of different percussion instruments. Some I picked up on the road. Some are given to me by guys in the band because they knew I was interested in percussion. Mm. So I, over the years, I've collected a, a lot of it. So the guitar has a, has a bell in it. It has a ring in it. And sometimes I'd attach this bell to it very subtly. It's not, not meant to be, you know, really noticed as much as felt. This bell that I'm holding now is called, this is what we call this a spinning bell. Oh, that's lovely. I don't know if you can hear it with this uh -huh. microphone, but it goes, woo, 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 woo. that's a different bell. It's used at a different time. It's just like a brass. It's a, it, it's Christmas about tree. four inches wide and it, it sort of looks like a, a pointy hat. And it's a, an eighth of an inch thick and it's made out of brass. And 
it has a string and you, you spin the string around so that when it unwinds, it spins. And as it spins, it the sound changes. I'll do it again. I don't know whether these microphones are going to be able to pick this up, but... That's just one of 10 different sounds that I used. And for me, if you consider this record to be a spiritually oriented record, the spirituality is mostly expressed in the music. Even though the words are on the same subject, but the unspoken, the silent conversation, so to speak, well, the conversation without words is the deeper spirituality for me because it's an exp it's some expression of something that I hear and feel without words. So going back to reviews, if you're not focused on that aspect, and most reviewers are not going to focus on that because most reviewers are writers, and so they focus on words. Some reviewers are musicians as well, and they hear these other things. When I was mixing the record, I played, played this for a, a musician friend of mine who happened to be in, a, in another adjacent studio. And he, he said, I, I like to listen to it at home. And then when he saw me the next day, he said, I kept thinking to myself, did I just hear, I thought I heard a glimmer of and then I wasn't sure. I kept thinking throughout the record, I'm, did I just hear that sound that I imagined or did I? That's exactly what I wanted. Who was the musician? It was Chris Thiele, who was mm -hmm. a brilliant mandolin player. Mm -hmm. And he was hearing one of those percussion notes that well, you there, He was hearing that or it could have been any number of things because I view there are so many subtle sounds used throughout this piece, so many. Mm -hmm. But the way I was hearing and the way he, he heard it was as if the sound stretched all the way to a horizon and I could just about make out what the sound was at the, in the farthest place away. So that, that's a very deep, not deep, uh, you know, intellectually or spiritually, but it has a deep visual perspective to sound. It goes way back. And it makes the guitar, this simple acoustic guitar, sound bigger. Anyway, that's what I'm trying to do. Mm -hmm. But and, wait, Paul, that was a review that you liked. I mean, effectively, he was a reviewer, and you liked what he had. <laughs> it's like conceptually. Yeah. yeah, because what he said was exactly what I hoped for. His interest was really piqued, but he wasn't sure whether his interest was meant to be piqued mm -hmm. or whether he imagined it. Well, that's great, because now you're really interested. Did I hear that? I loved his question. Did I hear that? Well, of course, the answer is yes, you did. And when you become aware that there are, there's a, an entire conversation going on way in the background that's related to what's going on in the foreground with guitar and voice, then for me, as the composer, it's much more interesting. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that when people listen to this record that, that, that they have to be aware of that. Most people, they're not supposed to be aware of it. It's just supposed to be pleasurable. You're supposed to say, I really like that. Mm -hmm. Why? I don't know. I, li I just liked it. That's fine. That's, what mo that's how most people hear musicians say, what was that? sound because they're trained to do that yeah. well the in this case i was going to talk about the the good problem is that the the lyrics are so good that you you get distracted i listened to it several times but one of the times i i listened to it the way i remember listening to records in the day when you'd have the lyrics from the album cover and you would read the lyrics as you were hearing them and you do that, you know, in one of your first or your second listens, just so you can kind of locate everything. Right. And I was doing that. I was doing this yesterday. And I was like, you know, it was incredibly important because it made me real focus for a moment on the poetry. And I, I was going to talk about this because 
I think the writing here is, is some of the best you've ever done. It's exquisite. There's a, and I say this as a, now I'm responding as a writer, because I'm a writer. There's a little bit, for example, in uh, my professional opinion, the, the line about the cows is as funny a line as you've, as you've written. No, I had that line for a long time. So. I heard two cows in a conversation, one called the other one a name, in my professional opinion. All cows in the country must bear the blame. I mean, come on, it's like, that's in the pantheon of great, great Paul Simon lines. Well, I don't know what that pantheon is. But anyway, <laughs> to me, the funny thing was the two cows in conversation. Yes, that's right. And that came from uh, out in Montauk, where I lived. There's like a, on the road that I drive up to our place, there's, there's mm. a big field and there are cows there. And you know, two cows were like leaning over the leaning over the fence, and so I thought of that line and wrote it down. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't for anything. It was just a line that I saved. Yeah, and put in there. Uh, my professional opinion. You know, I should say this really. I think the truth is that for people who enjoy enjoyed this record. The enjoyment is not enhanced by me explaining yeah. any of this stuff. I don't think it helps. It's better left unexplained. If it's your job to understand how records are put together, either you're a writer or you're a musician or you're a producer or an engineer, well, then you're really interested in it. But as, as a person who's not that and just uh, an average listener, they don't need to know that I put this bell over here for this reason or that. Or mm -hmm. It's either an idea that works and people like it, and in this case, they seem to really like it, or it doesn't work. And, or the, you know, and people don't, they don't hear it and they're not, they're not interested, which is also a fact that, that's going on too. There's a lot of people who never heard this, never will, and don't care. Yeah. Well, I want to go back to professional opinion for a moment, just because that was the one I was kind of fixating on. Can you talk a little bit about how the, the interaction between the music and the words in that case? This is about the structure of the entire piece. Mm -hmm. The first two songs, The Lord and uh, Love is Like a Braid, they have a certain feel to them, more like ballads. And a certain mood, I don't know what you want to call it, it doesn't matter what you want to call it, it has a certain mood. So this again goes to me as an editor of, my, of the piece that I'm working on. I think the listener who has heard this first two songs, and it's probably about eight or nine minutes worth, they have inferred a certain mood about this piece, but I don't want that to happen. So I purposefully make the third piece to mm. break that inference. So instead of having pieces that were, uh, that's a very different mood. Mm. We, do, you, don't perfect. stop, don't it's stop. <laughs> I'm enjoying myself. Oh. But the reason I, I... I can't remember. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I, the reason I'm not playing more is that, uh, well, I haven't played it in a long time, so I'm sort of going by muscle memory. Yeah, yeah. The reason, when you said that the, this isn't really just an album about you confronting your mortality, and the reason I agree with that is that that song, you're having so much fun. It's like, there's there's everything. There's mischief in it. There's... There's a little bit of street sass. There's, right. I can see you as a kid on the streets of Queens, like you're both commenting on and kind of mocking a little bit of the, you know, the popular culture. I don't know. It's just like, it's not a song about a guy at the end of his life confronting his mortality. It's about a song about a guy in the middle of everything. Like, you know, right. there's it so has, much fun in that. It has fun and it has jokes. Yeah, you know? it is, yeah, it has. Yeah. Good morning, Mr. Indignation. It's... Yeah. So the mood of the first two pieces is changed, or is hopefully is changed, by the rhythm of this piece and the lyrics, which have jokes or humor in them, mm -hmm. as well as their commentary. And it 
by the end of the piece, it's, the piece is summed up with all that really matters is the one who became us, anointed, and gamed us with his opinion. Mm -hmm. So that brings me back to the theme of where the entire piece is headed. Mm -hmm. And now I'm set for really the beginning of the album, Your Forgiveness. From here on, it's going to be sort of intense and growing. So the first, the first two songs introduce you to the mood and the theme. The third song says, don't get too settled into that and think that this is not what people are thinking. Yeah. This is what I'm thinking as someone who's observing attention span of a listening audience or imagining their attention span and trying to make it as enjoyable as possible by not allowing you to get bored too early. Yeah. But it's very, I mean, I'm remembering back to our long conversations two years ago, it's typical of your kind of writing and communication style that you like to establish something and then say, wait a minute, wait a minute. And then the, the humor often comes in you amending the, the right. impression that you've given. That's yeah. right. Yeah. There's a line, someone in one of the reviews, someone quoted that lovely line where you said, I, I'm a man who likes to travel, but maybe not since oh. I live. What's the line? Oh, that's from Darling Lorraine. That's yeah. a perfect example of yes. that. I think that might have been the first time that I may have used that kind of joke. The line is, uh, all my life I've been a wanderer, which I wrote because I just make up things as I'm searching for a melody. I wrote that line and thought, what bullshit, you know? So what it ends up in the song is, all my life I've been a wanderer. Not really, I mostly lived in my parents' home. Anyway, <laughs> Lorraine yeah. and I got married, yeah. and I love that the... The subject changes completely, 180 degrees. He says a line, it's just a lie. So then he says, ah, you know, that's bullshit. Really, anyway, back to Lorraine and I, we got married and, and that's the way conversations yeah. are. We don't just talk on one straight subject. We do this and then there's an interruption and we go over here and we say, oh, that reminds me, well, I have to pick up my clothes at the cleaners or a, a funny thing that somebody said. It's just... The mind changes all the time, and songs can be the same. And when they are, it doesn't upset the listener, I don't think. We have to pause for another quick break, and then we'll come back with more from Malcolm Gladwell and Paul Simon. We're back with the rest of Malcolm Gladwell's conversation with Paul Simon. My favorite component, I don't, I guess we don't want to call them songs. I don't know what, what we call them, but Sacred Harp is the one that I was really drawn to. That's mine too. I wanted to talk about that one because it has, on just on the writing front, there's that one little bit about when the, the kids get in the car and they say they would have mowed us down. I have it written down here. Um, and then we, we talk about the boy, about... He doesn't talk much anymore, just to the voices inside his head. The boy just gazed down at the floor and nodded once or twice at what she said. That little section that begins with her voice was a blend of regional perfumes. We have no destination. It's another one of those things where I was like, "That's this is as beautiful and perfect a section, lyrical section, as you've ever done. Well, it's like, thank you. it's an entire scene in a brilliant, moving powerful scene in four lines. Well, yeah, I, I could use you as a, my reviewer. You can review all my stuff. <laughs> I'm happy to. But I, no, I don't know where that came from, her voice, a blend of regional perfume, but it sang perfectly. Mm -hmm. And it also had a description of... Uh, when, you say, when, you, when you say it, it sang perfectly, what do you mean? It had the right syllables and the right sound to go with the melody that I mm -hmm. wanted to sing. I didn't have to push or fit it in. or It was a natural flow of words, but they also were an interesting description that I think would be easily understood. You could imagine what that would be, and it also implies... One thing about her as a 
it's very womanly. Mm -hmm. And the other is that it feels Southern too, to me. It's like regional perfumes. I don't think of it as New York perfume. <laughs> you know, I think of it as Southern. Yeah. Back country Maine is not a perfumed accent. Yeah, it feels like it's Texas. Yeah. Which is what it where it was set in my mind. You wrote that lyric here. Yeah. And that's why Edie's voice, which it serves serves the song in several ways that's that, that that are powerful, I think. First of all, you're not expecting to hear another voice come in on the record that has only been me and the guitars so far. So it's a surprise. And Edie is from Texas, and she sings great no matter what she does. She's one of those people that's, you know, has perfect pitch and sings in tune all the time. It's uh, very enviable. But she's also naturally inhabits that character. So to me, she sounds like, like that character, and it's really the two of us in, in a pickup truck, which she drives <laughs> anyway. So she was the right person to tell that story. And she her accent is like that. It is that sort of soft southern accent. Mm -hmm. So it's a little play. It's a little play that's going on there with different characters. And uh, sometimes like when when she's introduced with her lines, hurry, get yourself inside the truck to the, to the hitchhikers when it's raining, the both of us sing that line. I'm singing harmony to her. But I fade out my voice somewhere in the, in the middle of the first sentence. So it's sort of my voice introduces this character, but it doesn't stay for the conventional length of time, which is a lot, one line or something. It's not a, a usual duet form. It's a sound that comes and then disappears. That's like a lot of sounds on this record. They appear and they disappear. And then the listener says, what was that? Mm -hmm. Or hopefully they say that. It's meant to be the way we observe and the way we think. We don't think in four bars or eight bars. We think with no bar lines. Things come in they, and they go away. And, and that's what I was trying to do with the writing. And that song is a good example of, of me trying to do that. You never considered anyone but Edie for that. Oh, no, I never thought anybody else would, would do that. Were you thinking of her even as you first wrote the lyrics? I think once I put the other character in there, I knew it would be, would be Edie. And Edie and I, we haven't done it on record, but we've sung a lot in harmony. And like, like many years ago, Edie wrote these songs when our kids were little, and she used to take them to the park in the stroller. She would make up songs while they were in the, in the stroller and on the swing and... They were great songs, really simple, great, you know, that kids could sing along with, but, but beautiful. Wait, did she ever record those? We recorded them. Oh, you did? Yeah. So I know that we sing well together. We have a good, very good blend. So Edie was always that character. And then in Wait, she also fits that character. It's another character, the, that voice that comes in. It was like sort of angelic, and it, it also fits Edie's voice because... It's a voice that can go in a lot in a lot of places. Her natural inclination is to be a little bit bluesy, you know. Mm -hmm. She like her notes sort of fall off, and yeah. But in this case, she's just singing in this voice. That's I don't know who that voice is. You know, I mean, it would be uh, the cliche would be it would be like an angel's voice. You know, I mean, I, I wouldn't say that, but that's the cliche. Can you play any any bit of the music for Sacred Heart? Uh, yeah, I can play a little bit of the guitar. I forgot. I forgot uh, some of it. But why? When I said that was my favorite song, you said that's my favorite song too. Why is it your favorite song? Well, I love the duet. I really like the story. I like the the way the voices come in and the the way they dance with each other. Mm -hmm. 
I liked that little interval. I liked her voice, a blend of regional perfumes. I liked the way the mist turns from what she says in the beginning, uh, the rain will turn to mist with any luck and you can find a place to stay. That's what she says to the hitchhikers when they get in because she's like, we the drivers of the pickup feel bad that it's pouring rain, but we're really not in the mood for hitchhikers. So it's like, we're go come on in, but we're not going far. So we're telling you now it's not a long ride. You know, you, you, it's the, the rain will stop. You can go and find a place to stay. Mm -hmm. At the end of the story, it's uh, the ringing strings, the thought that God turns music into bliss. We left the pickup in the driveway. The moon, the moon appeared as amber in the mist, so that the mist becomes another meaning from the first time it's used. Things like that, as a songwriter, are satisfying because mm -hmm. it came together. Mm -hmm. I'm always trying to make it come together, but doesn't it that, doesn't happen all the time? The emotional range in that song is what I was doing. Was what you're alluding to now? Is that's what drew me. We, we have the generosity mixed with reluctance, which is a, you know, one kind of emotion. We meet these two people and they're broken, these kids. They're like on the run. Right. They're, and then we end on this kind of, with the beauty of that image of the, the mist. I mean, it's like this song in, what I was saying, the efficient, I mean, efficiency is a terrible word to use here, but the idea that in a, in that compact segment, you can range through these, this variety of emotions and make us feel all of those things as you're going. Well, you say they, they're broken. They appear to be broken. You know, uh, my boy and me, we're refugees of sorts from my hometown. They don't like different there. They would have mowed us down, mowed us down, you know, like weeds. Mm -hmm. So they seem like they're broken. He doesn't talk much anymore, just to the voices in his head. But really, they're seekers of spiritual bliss, you know, the sacred harp that David played to make his songs of praise. We long to hear those strings that set his heart ablaze. They're the enlightened pair, really. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting story, I thought. Oh, it's, 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 it's gorgeous. It's it's odd. It's the one. I mean, as someone who was raised in the church, it's it's the one. It's the song that's the most kind of explicitly biblical. It's a yeah. Really, you could turn that into a, a hymn. It could be sung in a church. I'd get a lot of pleasure if somebody if that was if it did find its way mm -hmm. into that environment. I'd like that. That would give you a lot of pleasure because they would recognize... Because uh, I like when songs go to different places. Mm -hmm. I like it when different communities of people hear something that they identify with in a song. It means that you can read, read different things into it. And uh, it's something that, as a songwriter, you would hope to achieve that, that, that something would appeal to many, many people on a personal level, and that personal interpretation would be quite different along the, the spectrum of the, of the listeners. Mm -hmm. That would be a successful song. And it happens naturally with every song because, as I've said, as we said in, when, we, when we had our long conversation, one of the things was that I, I believe that the listener completes the song. They hear it, they take in the meaning on a personal level, it may not be the meaning that I intended. They even change the words in their mind. When people sometimes repeat the words that there are their favorite words to me of the songs, it's not what I wrote, but it's what they heard. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. That's what the listener yeah. completes the song. So if this song was sung in an environment that was, it was a church environment, it would have a certain a certain kind of meaning. If it was sung in a different place, it would have a different, different meaning. That's good. It's good because it does have a it does have a, a choice of meanings. Mm -hmm. Was the production of this record different than previous records? Were you more? Was it more exhaustive? No, no, no. It was the same. 
It's the same. Uh, this was just a different uh, animal, that's all. It's not exhausting anyway. It's not exhausting, and I don't get bored with doing things over and over and over again. It's not even a thought that enters my mind, this is boring. It's You're searching for something that you, you, you can hear, but you haven't, haven't attained yet. So you really get interested in the, in the pursuit. It's not boring. It's not exhausting at all. It's, uh, I mean, it's really, uh, when you're hot on the trail, it's really exhilarating. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's part of what makes me like to do this and, and why I've spent my whole life doing it. Is, is I really enjoy it. And when I, I get it right for myself, then I get a little blast of dopamine in my brain and I'm addicted. I want it again. Thanks to Paul Simon for taking us behind the making of his newest album, Seven Psalms. Be sure to check out the audio original Miracle and Wonder Conversations with Paul Simon to hear more about Paul's brilliant career. You can find it at audible.com or at pushkin.fm. And again, we're releasing a new version of that book along with a brand new chapter about Seven Psalms this fall. You can hear Paul's new album, Seven Psalms, along with all of our favorite songs of his on a playlist at brokenrecordpodcast.com. Broken Record is produced with help from Leah Rose, Jason Gambrell, Ben Tolliday, Nisha Venkut, Jordan McMillan, and Eric Sandler. Our editor is Sophie Crane. Broken Record is a production of Pushkin Industries. And if you like the show, remember to share, rate, and review us on your podcast app. Our theme music's by Kenny Beats. I'm Justin Richmond.